Well, good morning, Bethel Church. Good morning. We're so excited that you're here. Why don't you stand with me today? Good morning. Listen, we are so excited that you're here, and we have been praying and believing for God to meet and encounter you. Yes, we sure have. <laughs> Welcome to church. Uh, listen, we want to, I just was thinking about this today as we've been in having these incredible services. You know, this is just a small part of what we do as a community. We have, we have meetings all week long. We have a Bethel School of Ministry. We have all kinds of stuff going on. And every time we go in those meetings, God is doing something unique and profound in those meetings. And today, as we were praying for you, I saw the Lord like bubbling over all the wells that have been happening all week long are going to bubble over here. And I saw that if you are dry or you're not sure what God's going to do, or maybe you feel like you're a mom that have pants on, you're excited that you finally got your pants on and you showed up today, or maybe you're, you know, somebody who's just trying to make it. I felt like the Lord said, get ready because the faith is accessible to you. And I was thinking about this. Uh, when Ben and I first got married, one of the first things I did was I went to the bank and I got on his bank account. You don't, you can become a co-signer on a bank account. And everything that was in his bank account, all $5 was mine as well now. That's right, that's right. Yeah, and what happens is in the spirit, this is important, is that when we get together as a community, we now become co-signers on what's available to somebody else. And so this is the cool part. If you came in and you don't have hope or you don't have faith or maybe you've been believing for pre-healing and you're not getting that, guess what? There are those in the room right now that have full bank accounts that are ready to give to you if you'll open up your heart and become a co-signer with them, right? So we, I, I just want to believe for you, Ben and I want to believe for you today that whatever empty bank account you have today, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, whether it's mental, whether it's just grief, whatever it is, that empty bank, bank account, we want to believe that today with worship and with the word and everything, it will be filled. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. All right, you guys, we love you. But before we go on, why don't you turn around to the person next to you and say, I'll take some of your money. Thank you. I'll take some of your account.
thousand generations falling down to worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us, all who will believe, sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Is your name? Your name is the high.
your name Cause your name is the highest Your name is the greatest Your name stands above All thrones and dominions All powers and positions Your name Sing it every voice. Your name. Your name is the highest. Your name. Everything changed It's getting harder to recognize The person I was Before I encountered Christ I don't walk like I used to I don't talk like I used to I've been washed from the inside I've been washed from the inside out
Church, would you lift your voice this morning? Sing praise. And praise the Father. Praise the Son. Oh, this is the body of Christ. Praise the third verse about the resurrection. the gospel shall not kneel and shall not faint before. It's in this, oh man, I like that so much. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go hit something. 
you know. I mean. <laughs> not you, though. Not you. Not you. Why don't you go ahead and sit down? I'll have you sit for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to share in communion together. If you don't have uh, the elements, the body of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, we've got these little packets here that help us. If you don't have any, put your hands up, and we've got ushers uh, that will get it to you real quickly. Yeah, put your hands up. Yeah. Couple up here, yep, yep, thanks. Yeah, we still have quite a few back in there. Right back, yeah, keep. don't grow weary in well doing. They'll, they'll get to you, I promise. Right there, yeah. <laughs> Maybe if you stood up and yelled, somebody would get it to you. Right there. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right. I, I, I have it. Thanks. Anybody else? Not, oh, way, way back there. I love when I, I, I don't speak today. Uh, we have one of Paul Manwaring with us today in scores. But I, I like when I speak on Communion Sunday because there's four services. I get to do this four times. And I figured out a long time ago, you can't overdose. You, you, you can't overdose on the, on the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. You just can't overdose. What an incredible privilege that we have uh, in this celebration meal, if you will. Jesus took the bread and he made this declaration. He said, he broke it. He said, this is my body. I don't understand that, but I'm going for it. This is my body and then this is my blood. And we're going to uh, share in this an absolute victory meal. Um, I, was, I was thinking earlier today about this verse out of Malachi that says, uh, the sun will rise with healing in its wings. The sun will rise. The sun of righteousness, excuse me, will rise with healing in its wings. What a, what a great statement. The sun of what? Righteousness will rise with what? Righteousness and healing. You see, healing is actually an expression of God's holiness. What sickness is to our body, sin is to our soul. And the redemptive work of Jesus was to break the power of both. And I, I look forward to us coming into these, not, not just moments that we do here, but at home. Uh, when, we, when we take of the broken body of Jesus and the blood that we that we discover together that we are actually rediscovering territory that is our inheritance and it's called divine health. And there's one thing greater than healing and that's health. <laughs> and I, I just feel like this morning I want us to kind of, as we take this broken body of Jesus, I like these hard little wafers. The reason is when I'm at home, I, I will stand before our, our family uh, portrait of all uh, 17 members of my immediate family, and I, and I take this uh, little wafer that speaks of the of the body of Jesus, and I break it. I like to be I like to be reminded. He became broken, so that we could become whole. He became empty, so that we could be filled. He was despised, so we could be celebrated. He was rejected so we could be accepted. He bore affliction so we could be healed. He did, he did everything to set the stage for us to come into the fullness of who he was. The question is asked, do you believe in predestination? I do. Every believer is predestined to be like Jesus. There is no plan B. There's no other options. We are all headed to that one place. And we come there through surrender to what he did. Surrender has been the most important word probably, that and simplicity, two most important words in the, for me in the last three months. Surrender is, is the place of, of great breakthrough. Great faith doesn't come from striving. It comes from great surrender. 
there's this yieldness, yieldedness that we that we have unto Jesus that makes nothing impossible. It's like the stage is set for God to be glorified again and again and again. So we're going to share in this triumphant, victorious meal together. Why don't you stand? I let you sit long enough. You should be sore. Yeah. <laughs> Take the, uh, the bread out of the little packet there and, and just break it just, just to remind yourself he truly did become broken, absolutely broken. Lou Engel, one of, one of the most important individuals in this house, this family of believers, and countless others across the nation flew to meet with Benny and me. See, Benny died in July, so it would have been the beginning of July, the end of June, somewhere in there. It's a very, very tender part of life. He flew to meet with us because the Lord had spoken to him about the coming Great Communion Revival, a revival based on the broken body and blood of Jesus. I'm reminded of that now constantly. And he came actually for Benny to pray for him because of what she had discovered in the beauty of communion. We don't have time to do this now, but I would just like to say, I I believe that the Holy Spirit is creating a momentum, a momentum that's beyond what any of us would create in a program. It's a momentum in realization. It's a momentum in discovery. It's a momentum in encounter. It's a, it's a momentum in, in breakthrough because of what Jesus has done. You've got family members. You've got friends. You've got people that you know that need a miracle. We're just going to take like a, a minute for this. Um, when I'm at home, I can take all the time I want and, and make sure that I cover everything that's in my heart. But in this moment, we have so many other things that are also important for us to do. But I'd like for you to hold this bread before the Lord. Thank you for his broken body. And make this confession. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. And you have a family member, a friend, somebody who's suffering. Maybe it's cancer, diabetes. I believe that Jesus is healing that here in this room this morning. We've had, I don't know how many deaf ears opened up yesterday. I think it was eight. It was a five, five. Eight. It was more than one. It was a whole bunch of deaf ears that just opened up in the healing rooms again yesterday. Miracles happen on a constant basis, and it's all because of Jesus. All because of Jesus. So hold this before the Lord, and I want you just to make the confession. Make it out loud. You don't have to yell it. Just make it out loud. I want you to make verbal commitment by the stripes of Jesus. His suffering, his torn flesh, I am healed. And I want you to pray that over a family member or friend. I give you like, let's take 30 seconds. You can do good, good stuff in 30 seconds. Pray out loud for a friend or family member, though. That's right, by the stripes of Jesus, cancer has been permanently defeated. By the stripes of Jesus, diabetes is defeated. By the stripes of Jesus, Parkinson's has been defeated. We just proclaim the gift of divine health over the people of God. Take us into a season to discover this gift that you've provided. Now take this broken body Give thanks with me to the Lord for this that he's provided for us. Let's take the bread together. I apologize to our online community. I forgot to warn you, we were taking communion. Uh, Hopefully you've been able to scramble so that you could join us in this. We have people all over the world that join us in these moments. And I, I want to make sure that the power of breakthrough comes to every household present, and, and our family online. Take this uh, cup, if you will. I, I should receive some sort of prize for holding the mic and opening this. I, I, I just want to draw your attention to that. <laughs> I'm not wearing it. That's the goal right there, right? 
This is what I like to declare over my family. I stand literally before our family portrait and I, I make several confessions of faith. One, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Say that with me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have authority to do that. You actually have authority. You have authority given by God. In the Old Testament, one lamb was sacrificed per household. It wasn't one per person, one per household. It is the heart of God for every one of your family members come, to come to faith, to come to know Jesus. So confess that with me once again. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <laughs> Let's do it all together so we actually sound intelligent. All right. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now take just a moment and pray for the blood of Jesus to touch one or two specific family members that you know are really in a battle. Just take a moment to confess that over their life. Yeah. We just plead the blood of Jesus. There's always a chance that there's people here that have never made a confession of faith. It's really important that you do before you partake of this. Just even right where you are, just say, Jesus, please forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. I come to you entirely. I will hold no other gods before you. I will serve you and you alone. Father, I give you thanks for the blood of Jesus that sets free. I thank you for the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Man, we sang it over and over and over again. I was about to jump out of my shoes this morning. Over and over again about the beauty, the wonder, the power of the blood of Jesus. Can we just give thanks for the wonder, the beauty? There is no forgiveness apart from the shedding of the blood of Jesus. We do give you thanks. Let's partake of this together in honor of the Lord. Wow, wow, wow. How about on the count of three, just shout hallelujah. One, two, three. <laughs> wow, what an what a absolute wonderful moment. I, I pray that the anointing of communion would fall upon households and that people would actually come, come to faith walking into your home in Jesus' name. All right, turn and hug somebody around you. Bless them really good. And uh, we'll get moving here. You get over-the-top introductions here, you know. You probably heard the whole thing, you know, the, the man who was introduced as the person who'd made a million out of, out of oil. And he said, no, it wasn't me, it, wasn't, it was my brother. It wasn't oil, it was coal. And I didn't make a million, I lost it. But apart from that, the introduction was perfectly accurate. So. <laughs> um, it's always good to be here, to say the least. It's understatement territory. And uh, yeah. Two things that, uh, for me, this house gave me and continues to give me is number one, it's home. On. And home isn't, isn't a place. It's, it's an address in my heart that we all got given here. I'll, I'll say to the alumni, y you'll never find this again. I'm not saying there aren't places that are wonderful, but you'll never find this again. And uh, home is an address in my heart of shared values and trust and love and covering. And uh, it enables me when I go somewhere to recognise a little piece of home somewhere else and serve what I see there rather than spend my whole life trying to find something that I'll probably never find um, completely. So um, I said earlier, uh, we go to a, a relatively small church start-up in Windsor and uh, we go there for community, to be honest. It's where our kids go and it's community and we're trying to build some local community that's important to us. And um, I went in there last Sunday. I don't, I don't get there very often because when you travel, and I add, I have a grandson who plays rugby on Sunday mornings, which is an, an, another form of church, actually. <laughs> um, and I'm not really joking. Um, and some of you are laughing, but you follow baseball. It's a similar kind of thing. I've, I, I see you, you know, it's, uh, but um, so I don't often get to church 
my local church and I walked in and, and Leon, the leader, just said, if you get anything during worship, let me know. And I said, the issue isn't if I'll get anything during worship. The issue is, do you want me to bring what I get in worship? Because we've been trained in this house that he's here. So he's, he's always speaking. He's, all, he's always going to say something. And so home is, is very much, this is home. It will forever be home. And it enables me to find lots of other places that are home as well. So, and coming back here always has that thing, to, should we have left? And then you sort of slap yourself and go, yeah, you know you had to leave. There were things to do and you were sent. And Apart from the fact that I now have a 100-year-old mum that is requiring a little bit of attention. I, I guess that comes to us all when we turn the 100 point. You know, sort of need a little help. She got her... She got her card from the Queen, so that was nice. She really does do that. Well, she doesn't anymore. She stopped. But, yeah. <laughs> Passed it on to someone else, you know. But, yeah. The second thing Bethel gave me was a new normal. And um, I think sometimes, I, I feel like it's quite important for me to just say this. There's something, very, it's important for us to work out what this house gives us. And it gave me a new normal, a, a new way of viewing life and circumstances and God and other people. It's absolutely a gift to me. In fact, when I, when I, when I was sent from here, I, I wrote a list of about 100 new normals that I'd been given in my life. Um, it, now, it is also a very real problem because the other new normal I have is I learned to drive on the wrong side of the road <laughs> for 15 years, which means that it's now instinctive for me to drive on both sides of the road. It really is. So, I mean, Dan, you'll understand this, you know, my wife and I, we rarely disagree, but one disagreement is why won't I drive my right-hand drive car into France like I used to before I came here? It's because I need the wheel in the middle of the road. I have to have that. Um, and I have turned left on reds as well, which is illegal in England. But any police here, you have no jurisdiction over my country, so you can't do anything. But um, no, this is a very, very special place. I'm you know, deeply honoured that I, uh, I get given a microphone, even if I've just got off a plane and nobody seems to be worried that jet lag will disturb the balance of my mind. But, um, <laughs> but uh, no, it's an absolute privilege and uh, there is nothing quite like here. So the, the challenge is always what you share when all of a sudden Chris is saying, do you want to preach? Because the answer is yes because I said a long time ago that there are some things in this house I'll never say no to, and one of them is the opportunity to share in this house because it's an absolute honour. But then the, the next challenge is, is what? So, and I've been around something for a, for a little while that I, uh, I'm just going to talk about. I, I don't know what your, your experience of life um, has been recently. I mean, I've already joked about the Queen who I'm, I'm glad she's probably sharing the joke because she's up there. She knew Jesus, there's no question. But, you know, in terms of a little confusion, you know, the UK's had two monarchs and three prime ministers in the last few months. So it's been a little, it's been a little hectic, as the South Africans would call it. That was for you, Libby. Um, it's, you know, and there's some other stuff going on, you know, economic challenges, war in Ukraine, a whole bunch of stuff in our, in our world. And that doesn't begin to mention some of the individual things that you are probably going through. And if you're not, and you have no challenges in your life, you should get up here and take the microphone, really, because you can then pray for us all and tell us how to do it. <laughs> but where I've, uh, I've found myself landing is in that first resurrection Sunday night. I know it's getting near to Christmas to preach about Easter, but I think it's legal all year round. Um, but John chapter 20 and verse 19, I want to read the beginning of 19, then I'll go back to the rest of it um, and just explain a, a couple of thoughts that um, are in the sort of the backdrop of this. When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, which is the first Resurrection Sunday, which in my theory, I think all churches should make sure they have an Easter Sunday night service because otherwise they might just stop at the Mary Magdalene bit and miss this passage, which is Sunday evening. Uh, and it's, it's become very precious to me. Hopefully you'll understand why as I share. The first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst. Let me just stop there. They were locked, not in an, a shed, but in a solid stone building for fear of the Jews. This was real. 
what had been going on in the city in terms of corruption and, you know, arresting people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They were in genuine, real fear. Not only that, imagine with me the conversation in that room. There's 10 of them, I think. Thomas wasn't there. Poor Thomas, who wasn't there. And because he said, well, show me, if I see his hands and his side, I believe, gets called Doubting Thomas for all eternity, poor guy. I mean, who wouldn't have said the same? Well, if you've seen it, when I see it, I'll believe it too. I mean, that's, I'd have done the same thing, you know? Um, but Doubting Paul doesn't have the same ring as Doubting Thomas, I guess. So maybe that's what it is. So there's no Judas, no Thomas, 10 disciples in the room locked for fear of the Jews, real fear. And what were they saying? What a week they'd had. The last eight days, it began with the triumphal entry, which we now call Palm Sunday. Riding on a donkey, Hosanna, Hosanna, the crowd is shouting. The crowd are asking themselves, who is he? Well, he's the prophet. He's Jesus of Nazareth. There's that buzz of Jesus has entered the town. Little did that crowd know that a few days later, some of the same crowd would shout, crucify him, crucify him. The disciples are locked in that room. They, they've been with Jesus. And now they've walked through those eight days of, of the law, the justice failing of religious leaders failing, political leaders, arguments, crowds jostling for one man to be freed over Jesus. They've seen all of that. They were, they were there at the Passover night where Jesus said, one of you will betray me. They were there in the Garden of Gethsemane, rebuked for falling asleep when they should have been praying, but saw there Jesus sweat drops of blood. They'd watched His robe being ripped off. They'd, they'd watched the flogging of Jesus. They'd seen Him carry His cross up and they'd seen Him crucified on that cross. They'd heard the, the severing, seven sayings of Jesus on that cross. They had been through all of that. Can you imagine their conversation? That we tend to sanitise yeah. because we've got so familiar with it. I mean, I just think of one circumstance in my life where I've been through something tough and the conversation that I'm gonna have with my friends about it. These guys are going through that conversation. Chaos and confusion is all through the city. They're afraid. And not only that, wondering what they're gonna do tomorrow, Monday. Because for three years, all they knew to do was follow Him. Eat where He eats, go where He goes, Say what He says, be with Him. Lay down where He lays down. Be quiet when He's quiet. What do we do tomorrow? What's our purpose tomorrow? What do we do? And not only that, but, well, He'd appeared that morning, but was that just a one-off? The dead raises dead, basically. They felt powerless. They'd watched all of these things unfold and felt powerless, did not know what to do, how to intervene. And not only that, their friend had betrayed him. Their close friend, they'd walked together for those three years with Judas and he had betrayed. On that Gethsemane night, he had betrayed Jesus. And now they're huddled in a room. That sounds a lot like our world today to me. Confusion, chaos, political infighting, judicial systems letting other people down, religious infighting, stuff all over the place. Sounds a bit like our world. If it doesn't sound like yours, you must have a good prayer life. But there's a whole load of stuff going on, isn't there? And then there's what we've come through with COVID particularly, but I think there are other causes and that is people having a loss of purpose in their lives. Why am I alive? Somehow COVID exacerbated that and made people question, why am, why am I alive? And this kind of low grade, I describe it as this sort of thing that is behind my head here, chasing me down with this question of, should you be doing something? What are you doing? Why are you alive? Just that nagging doubts in the back 
of people's heads with a loss of purpose and a low-grade depression sweeping across the globe. And people feeling powerless. Powerless when things happen to us, whether, whether we're believers and we pray for something and not seeing what we believe for, or, or people generally out in the world feeling powerless, feeling helpless, just like those disciples. Chaos, confusion, questioning what they're going to do tomorrow, feeling powerless and betrayed. Because surely the conversation would have included, well, Judas started this. What if Jesus hadn't done that? What would have happened? Where would this week have gone? And I, I for one, have seen some of my closest friends betrayed in recent years. And wider than that, we see people let us down, disappoint us, fail us in some way. I don't think that that scene is that different from the scene of life that we live. But the good news is, as Jesus said before He taught the disciples the Lord's Prayer, your heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask Him. We, we see it in different places. You even see it in the, in the week leading up to Easter that the donkeys were already ready. The person with the water pot on their head was already ready to lead to the, the room for the Passover. He knows what you need before you ask Him. And these disciples are about to be told the answers to what they need without ever asking for what they need. Jesus walked in the room. Uh, I mean, you probably actually don't need much more than that, but, but I mean, he said some things, but we do need to learn to live our lives with an awareness that he will walk into any room that we're in. He will break through the walls of any room we're in. Whatever you're huddled down trying to work out, he will break in and his presence will be among us. But then, then he says this, he says, peace be with you. Now, honestly, the first time I shared this, someone said, well, that's just a greeting. It doesn't mean what you're saying. He said, well, it might be a greeting the first time, but he said it a second time. You can have the greeting for the first one, but the second one, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And I want to say this, peace is a person. He's the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. A child is born, a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Peace is a person, not just a change to how you feel that just sweeps over you and you grab hold of something from the ether, so to speak, but peace is a person. And just as surely as the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of the garment of a healer, I believe that if you touch the hem of the garment of the Prince of Peace, you'll find peace. Because peace is the answer to chaos. Peace is the answer to confusion. Peace is a person. Sue and I have started going to a church on, on Sunday, actually Sunday afternoons, five o'clock, perfect church time for us in our season of life. Love it. And still time to go out for a meal afterwards and it's just on the edge of London. And it's a church that 30 of our alumni go to. Worship's led by uh, one of our alumni, Sam Udi. We, we started going there because our Sunday evenings church stopped meeting on Sunday evenings after COVID and we just needed to be in the room, <laughs> as simple as that. And, uh, and we got there and, and it's an Anglican church. And they, uh, they use a lot of the liturgy during the morning services. The afternoon service, they don't so much. I mean, the vicar, for those that know this stuff, and he's not wearing his dog collar. He's wearing black jeans, black T-shirt and Doc Martin boots. And, uh, but then he says, we're, we're about to do what I, what I know. And that is we're gonna share the peace. And I knew I had a choice. I, I'm in a room with five or 600 mostly young people. And I knew I had a choice. Because you can just skirt past it and just go, the peace of the Lord be with you. And I'm not trying to turn Bethel into an Anglican church. I'm not that foolish. But, but there are some things that we can learn. We have a liturgy. We just read it as we receive today's offering, it's a liturgy. The only thing wrong with liturgy in, is if it's separated from the Holy Spirit and power. If you separate it from the Holy Spirit and power, forget it, it's religion. But when it's attached to the Holy Spirit and power, it's powerful. And I knew I had a choice when somebody comes up to me and says, the peace of the Lord be with you, I have a choice. Am I gonna look you in the eye, Heather, and say the peace of the Lord be with you and mean it? 
and believe that the Prince of Peace lives in here or am I just going to do the peace of the Lord be with you? Peace is a person. See, Jesus delivers the answer to the problem. If I gave this message a title, there'd probably be a million, but one of them would be you have everything you need. And the first is you have access to peace for your chaos. You have access to the Prince of Peace for your chaos. And I, I believe that it's something we could learn to do. A lot of Middle Eastern countries, of course, they actually say shalom or salam alaikum, alaikum salam. They effectively say the peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. That's their greeting, not hi, how you doing? The peace of the Lord be with you. If your life right now is confusing, chaotic, I wanna invite you to stand. If you have challenges in your life right now, I wanna invite you to stand. If you're around someone that's standing, I want you to find them. I want you to look them in the eye and I want you to say, the peace of the Lord be with you. Say it two or three times. Look them in the eye. Your eyes are the window of your soul. It's in the Bible. You're speaking peace and peace is a person. And I'm believing that this changes things. And I pray that you will learn to have access to the Prince of Peace as you walk through this week. Whatever room you find yourself huddled down in, to be able to pause for a moment and access the Prince of Peace and touch the hem of his garment. You have all you need. You may be seated. And then Jesus says, after the second peace be with you, he says this, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Now, some of you know that I, I love this and uh, I, one of the things that I just have a passion about is around this verse. I want every believer to know their sin. Ben agrees with me. Yeah, <laughs> every anvil. We're good, we're getting somewhere. I want every believer. What, what did I just say though? See, I think there's something that people don't quite understand about this. I think there's, there's almost some connotations with, with a formal way of doing church life that somehow being sent was somehow controlling, that somehow had pain attached. Being sent is a privilege. Yeah. It's one of the great privileges. I don't have daughters, but those that have daughters and have walked them down the aisle have given their daughter in marriage. What they've effectively done is sent them. And they have sent them with this. You have permission to reproduce our family where you're going. Yeah, come on. That's what it means to be sent. It's not about control. And Jesus is saying, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Yeah. Their loss of purpose is summed up in this statement. Now, I'm not, you don't have to have the whole thing worked out. I don't need to do a full whiteboard coaching session on you. All I want you to know is in the, in the core of your being, I know I'm sent. Yeah. Yes. I know I've received a heaven sent assignment. I personally believe we're sent twice. I believe we're sent from heaven and through the church, we're sent again to expand the influence of the King. Yes. But that might be for another day. But we're sent. Yeah. You see, a loss of purpose in life is because we have separated ourselves from what Jesus said to the disciples. As the Father sent me, so I sent you. Disciples, don't worry about tomorrow morning. We got it. It's in hand. You're sent. Our gospel's an apostolic gospel. You know that, don't you? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He sent. He sent His Son. It's an apostolic gospel. It's a sending gospel. It, it's the very core of our faith. We're the sent ones but we haven't grabbed hold of this. We haven't grasped this. What Jesus is saying is, my Father sent me, I'm sending you. You know, one of the things I, there's, I said to, 
to Chris, you know, when you, when you preach here, you, you never quite know which verses you might go or how long you might go. And I, I don't stick to really rigid notes, but there's a verse I didn't mention in the first service where Peter said this. He said, make all the more, be all the more diligent to be certain of God calling or choosing you. Wow. It's this. Why, why did Paul write, uh, Peter write that verse? Because he denied him. Yeah. That verse is the fruit of a denial experience. That denial experience comes, becomes a message to us. Be all the more diligent to make certain of God calling on choosing you. In other words, sending you, sending me, you're sent. My passion is that everyone here, when they sit at their desk tomorrow morning, walk into their classroom, work as a doctor, work as a waitress, homeschool mum, whatever list, knows they're sent. See, too many of us have spent too long in our lives, I think, waiting for us to be at a line at the front of a church where we get hands laid on and we're sent. We've already been sent. Jesus did it. And you can't be sent by anyone bigger than Jesus. We're the sent ones. I want you to know tomorrow morning you're sent. There's a purpose in your life because you're sent. Remove the nagging doubt. Get rid of that low-grade depression and sit at your computer or whatever it is you do with this awareness. I'm sent, now what do I do with it? How do I apply this as a sent one? If you've been struggling with loss of purpose, even a nagging low-grade depression or anxiety about your life, why you're alive, I wanna invite you to stand. My prayer for you right now is this. I want you to know you're sent. You're sent. This is for everybody. Not just for people who get microphones strapped to their ears and get paid to go to church. We're the sent ones. We're the sent ones. You're sent. Put put your hand on your guts for a minute. I know it's I know it's a heart, hands on heart church here, but let's go guts. Just let's be radical. Let's shift it. I want you to know in here that you're sent. Yeah. You'll sit in a truck tomorrow. You'll drive your van to a plumbing appointment and you'll have this awareness, I'm sent. Yeah. I'm on assignment. Yeah. One of the things the Anglican church do, their, their closing prayer in Anglican churches, most of their prayers include sent, get out of here, go out. The goal isn't come to church. The goal is to leave the church and change the world. Come on. Father, I pray right now that you will put something in everyone standing that gives this inner assurance I'm sent, I matter, I have a purpose. I'm in alignment with a heavenly assignment. You're sent in Jesus' name, amen. And then he addresses powerlessness. He addresses it. I mean, he, he has all the answers, just like the father in the prodigal son story where the boy says, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And the father has a ring, a robe, a sandal and a barbecue because the father had all the answers for the boy's speech. That's why that illustration is so powerful because our father has all the answers for the speeches that we've got going on in our minds. I feel powerless. What do I do? And Jesus walks in and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, if I'm right, that is the first time that that phrase is uttered post-resurrection. Dan's here, he's nodding. I think I'm roughly safe. It was a three-quarter nod I got from Dan there. I think I'm all right. But what's the point? Paul said this, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. And Jesus is saying here on Resurrection Sunday night, receive the Holy Spirit. I've been raised by this Holy Spirit. I'm standing here amongst you because of this Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. I I love Pentecost Sunday. I love Acts chapter two. I love the whole deal. But honestly, I think Acts chapter two tends to lead us to more tongues and fire baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's bigger than that. The baptism of the Holy Spirit must be bigger than that. Holy Spirit obviously is a person, but it's so much more. Our powerlessness might be we need the spirit of truth. Our powerlessness might be that we need the spirit of adoption, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of boldness, the spirit of courage. It it might be something other than we've limited it. We've limited what we ask for. Jesus, 
That Sunday night is saying, receive the Holy Spirit. You don't need to feel powerless. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you have a circumstance in your life right now where you feel powerless, I want to invite you to stand. I was recently with a gathering of leaders. A friend of mine and I gave a challenge to them. We don't quite know where the whole thing's going. We gave them five challenges. I'm only going to tell you one of them. One challenge was this to these church leaders, never hold a meeting without the opportunity for a demonstration of power. Don't do it. This is our assignment. It's, It's to demonstrate power in powerless situations where earth doesn't have the answers. Just begin to receive the Holy Spirit afresh all over again but be specific maybe it's wisdom you need maybe it's healing you need maybe it's the spirit of adoption you need maybe it's truth you need we have everything we need whatever that situation is that you're huddled down like one of the disciples feeling powerless in the locked room receive the Holy Spirit And I don't think my challenge is just for church leaders. I think it's for all of us. Never have a day of your life without standing in front of something impossible and praying that it changes in the name of Jesus. Receive the Holy Spirit. Expand your view of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. And then he says, I think it's a scary verse. It might be one of the scariest verses in the Bible. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. That's all right. If you retain the sin of any, they've been retained. What's he saying? He's come in the room to a group of guys in confusion, chaos and fear feeling purposeless and powerlessness, powerless and hurt because they were betrayed. Betrayed by their friend. I'm sure there are people in this room who've been betrayed in recent years. Situations, maybe even, you know, people you don't know, but global leaders in the church that feel, you know, we've, they've let us down, they've disappointed us. We feel somehow betrayed. I think one of the temptations is we can easily think, well, if you knew what they did to me. I love that we took communion this morning. You can easily skip over. I've been in church services where people garble their way through. 1 Corinthians, where Paul says his great words on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And they gamble through it at such a speed That statement was not the introduction to a Charles Dickens novel to know the time, date and place. It is a statement to understand the context in which Jesus took bread and wine in front of his betrayer and then proceeded to speak and teach about the power of forgiveness. If my wife were here, I'd look down at her and make sure that I got the words right. But she says something like this. It's really difficult to hold something against someone else when you've got bread and wine in your hand. Which is why we take communion regularly so that I know I'm good with her basically, but that's... I tell you what, it's a good marriage. I mean, we don't, have never had marriage problems, but you know, you might start there before the marriage counselling and just go, let's take communion together, look each other in the eye and say, I love you and I forgive you. It's just that was free. That's the extent of my marriage counselling advice. I don't have any other. But what's the point? What Jesus is doing, He's saying, forgive, forgive. I don't know what that verse means really. Not really. But I have a feeling that it's written to be scary so that we pay attention to it. So that we pay attention, forgive. This is a really simple message. It really is a simple message. 
Peace is the answer to chaos. Being sent is the answer to feeling purposeless. The Holy Spirit is the answer to feeling powerless. And forgiving is a key to walking our lives the way that Jesus paid the price for us to walk. It's really simple. We carry the peace. We have a purpose. We have access to power. And we can walk in relational health with other people by forgiving. And we don't have any excuse to say, oh, if you knew how badly I was treated. No, the example is Jesus. If you have someone in your life right now, you're struggling to forgive, I wanna invite you to stand. And I wanna add to that, I'm standing. And it's not Chris I'm struggling to forgive, by the way, just in case. You No, I have a complex relational situation and it's just, I have to actively forgive someone because it, the, the cause and effect keeps happening. So you have to stay on it. It's not that I failed to forgive. It's like it keeps coming back. It's like, forgive. I just want you to begin to release forgiveness. And I tell you this, if it's hard today, try again tomorrow. I know somebody... He spent a long time forgiving one particular person. It was a real battle for them. But they took that forgiveness all the way to praying for them to be saved. Wow. It was a battle, but they got there. Come on. Just begin to release forgiveness to those that you're standing up for. Just release forgiveness. Just begin to utter the words. Sometimes it's really hard, but these are absolute keys. I Honestly, I love inner healing. Everybody here knows how much I love it. I speak at Sozo conferences. I'm privileged to do that in the UK as well. I love it. But I do think sometimes we might just need to just step back and make sure we've done the basics of forgive, forgive, forgive. You may be seated. This incredible Sunday night is stunning to me. Is absolutely stunning. This Sunday night, the disciples at the end of such a challenging week are locked in a room and Jesus walks in and knows exactly what to say to them. What, what I love is as well that, that Paul references this. He references this in the sequence. Paul is, I can't remember whether I said it in this service or not, but Paul is obsessed. He's obsessed with the resurrected Jesus. He really is. Yeah. And he gives the list. He says, first I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died from, for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Then He gives the list of who Jesus appeared to and then says, and last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, He appeared to me also. And I, I just believe we need to develop an appetite and a hunger to encounter the resurrected Jesus, to, to access the resurrected Jesus. I love the whole story of Jesus. I love the lot. I love the whole book. But I, I'm developing this hunger to access the resurrected Jesus. I want Him to walk into my room, my huddled down situation and say, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. You're not powerless Receive the Holy Spirit and check your heart. Make sure you're walking in relational purity and dealing with that. These are basics, but I have a feeling that we need basics in this season because of what, is, what we're up against. I'm actually gonna share something at the leader's advance, not the same, but a similar sequence that the answers to the challenges that we all face, we have everything we need. Why don't you stand Holy Spirit, would you refresh us as we go out? I pray that everybody who walks out of these doors today, whoever they are, whatever they do, wherever they go, will have this awareness that they're sent. They're the sent ones, sent from heaven to earth and through this family, through this church, sent out into the world to expand the influence of King Jesus, carrying peace with them, carrying power with them and carrying the power to forgive people's sins. Send us out, Lord. 
Send us out. Send us out. And Jesus, we love you. We adore you. We love to sing the songs of your resurrection. We love you. We adore you. I just want to add one thing. I feel to say it. I've been around a lot of people just lately and talking about churches and altar calls and I realised something. I know they're for the lost, but they really do me a lot of good too. And the beauty of inviting people to come forward and find Jesus is that it reminds me to be thankful that he saved me. Just say this with me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. Just put your hand on your heart. I feel that we should go out thankful that he saved us. For the the simplest truth of them all, thank you for saving me. Amen. So good. Just hold your seats for just a second. Um, Ministry team, you can go ahead and make your way forward here and just line up up front. That'd be great. Wow, what a service. What a message. Can we just give Paul a big hand? Thank you for that. That was amazing. So good. So good. You know, just uh, powerful things have been happening here on on Sunday nights. Just last week, um, the gospel was preached and a handful of people came forward to get saved and somebody got saved that has been born and raised right here in Reading and never known the Lord, never read her Bible before, and she got radically saved. It was just a powerful moment. And the Lord is just revealing himself. Simply, he's the only way to the Father. There's no other way. Nobody else shed their blood. And not only shed their blood, but rose again from the dead, defeating death, hell, and the grave once and for all. You can't add to the blood of Jesus. He's the only way to the Father. You've heard that all throughout this day. Maybe you're in this room right now and you're, you're, you're looking around like he had referenced the prodigal son. Was, he got all of his inheritance and he ran away from the father and, and did just squander his life. And, and he woke up one day sitting with pigs and pigs in a pig's pen and he realized, this is, I ain't, I'm not, this is not the life I should be living. This is not where I want to be. Sometimes our choices, you know, you just get busy. You don't mean to do bad. You just get busy and your, your choices sometimes can just drift away and Maybe perhaps you're here and you've you've found yourself in a place where you're just like, this is not where I want to be living right now. This is not the place I want to be. You know what's powerful about public confession is we're, we're saying not just here to our friends, but also in the spirit realm, my life belongs to Jesus. And it's closing the door on all demonic uh, assaults on our minds and, so, and just all that stuff. But if you're here right now and you want to surrender your life to Christ, maybe you're looking around your life and you're just going, I need to rededicate my life to the Lord. I need to come back fully. I want to be on fire again and just let go of these things. If that's you, just raise your hand up in the air. Just wave it up in the air. Come on. God bless you, man. Let's go. God bless you over there. God bless you guys. Come on. Wonderful. Maybe you're here right now and you've never surrendered your life to Christ. Maybe you've been coming to church, you've been around church, but you've not made that public surrender yourself. And even online, if that's you, if that's you right now, just raise your hand up and say, I'm ready to do it right now. All in, let's go. Anybody here? In the great room. Online. All right. Anybody here? Wonderful. Okay, the people that just raised their hand to rededicate your lives to the Lord, just raise them up again. Just right where you're at. Just put them in the air. People just get around them right there. Just, just lay hands on them right there. And just pray. Let the fire of God just touch them right now. Let the fire of God just touch them right now. Come, Holy Spirit, for a fresh baptism of fire. Just say this right now out loud, church. Just say, Jesus, wash me. Make me clean from the inside out. I surrender all to Jesus. <laughs> Fill him, Holy Spirit. Fill. Wash with your blood. Make clean. Make new in Jesus' name. Come on. Hey, if you're here right now and you need a miracle in your body, you need a miracle in your marriage, something, anything. All these people up front here are ready to just agree with you for that miracle and agree in prayer. So come receive prayer. Don't forget tonight's going to be a powerful night. We'll see you then. God bless you.